Humans have had a close relationship with animals for thousands of years. Scientists agree the domestic dog has been a trusted pet for around 15,000 years. And cats became part of the household from 10,000 years ago. And now it's estimated there are at least 600 million pet cats in the world. Exotic pets have also been kept for thousands of years. It's well documented that the Egyptians kept baboons as pets and exotic animals kept in the home feature in many ancient texts. In modern times, the keeping of exotic pets has increased. A staggering statistic is that there are more tigers in the U.S. alone than there are in the wild. Animal owners truly believe they are playing a role in preserving the numbers of exotic animals. But on the other side of the debate, there are those who believe it is a cruel practice to keep any animals in captivity. This series explores the issues on both sides. Those who know the dangers, but see the benefits. To others who condemn the keeping of exotic pets. Their stories follow. Standing next to an elephant is an awe-inspiring experience. There is a thrill that comes with being so close to a wild animal, a mix of fear and excitement. No matter how exhilarating it is, there's always an element of danger. Charlie Samet is the founder of Monterey Zoo in Salinas, California. It's because of his experience and incredible way with his animals that working not just so close to, but actually amongst the herd of elephants is even possible. Christy, Paula. Buffy, there must be a convention going on down there that I wasn't made aware of. Hi, girl. Come on. You ever been in a stampede? This is the first time for everything. Hi, girl. Move up. Ah, what's going on here? Hmm? Not a girl. Mm -hmm. That's gross. This is Christy. That's Buffy. Buffy was a carnival elephant. Christy was a circus elephant. And they just both found retirement homes here. I do have to say, though, from the entertainment industries they came from, they came to us very healthy, very sound, um, very well taken care of. So they weren't what I would consider a rescue by any means. They were just done working in those environments and uh, needed a, a place to retire. Had it not been for Charlie, there's no way we would have felt comfortable enough to come so close to these potential lethal heavyweights. Somebody once said that the day you get elephants, your life changes forever. And they couldn't have been more right. So our entire lives revolve around these elephants. If we're on a boat somewhere in the Bahamas and I get a phone call that one of them is down, we're on a plane home. Doesn't matter, nothing comes before the elephants. It's, they're, they're literally your children. They're very demanding. They're, uh, you know, they are dangerous. When you first get them, you have to move into their lives very carefully. This is Paula, she's our old lady, and it's really kind of funny that she's here right now because she's usually so bashful. What are you doing? Huh? Charlie started out in law enforcement with no ambition to work with exotic animals. What are you doing? I was a police officer here in Seaside. We served a warrant one night and arrested somebody, and he had a pet mountain lion in the back in his garage. And uh, long short of it, I ended up with it. I took it home that night. Stupidest thing I ever did. I threw a mountain lion in the back of a Toyota pickup truck with a camper shell and took it home with me. I put it in my dog kennel in the backyard. That's where it all started. Hey, what are you doing? Of course, once you've got a mountain lion, why not also get an African lion? Charlie did, and it would change his life completely. The lion turned out to be an extraordinary animal named Joseph, who led Charlie into a new career working with Joseph and other animals in the film and entertainment industry. 
Still, he certainly never imagined he would end up owning elephants. No. Really? How rude. My personality does tend to lend itself to doing well with them. I'm, you know, fairly aggressive, fairly dominant, and they respond well to that. They're very comfortable with that. So we've always done very, very well together. But I gotta tell you, we've had some horrifying days, sad days that, you know, we've lost two and uh, it's taken weeks to get over. What are you doing? Hmm? So I guess some could argue that this is probably my favorite place in the world. You know, it's just one of those things where you can't imagine what it's like to have friends like this. Highly intelligent animals, elephants form deep family bonds and live in tight family groups called a herd. Charlie is part of the Monterey Zoo herd. Well, I mean, I actually do feel like one of them. So as soon as they get to me, they do what they need to do, they say hi, and then I'm just one of them, and then they start doing whatever else around me. The thought of them going out to our driveway and us not seeing them again just couldn't happen. Couldn't imagine it. Elephants are often seen as placid, gentle animals, but there's no doubt they can pose a very serious threat. Charlie's elephants are hand-picked in a measure that helps ensure the safety of his team. We never brought anything here that we thought was gonna be a threat to our staff. Uh, we do have one, this one here, who had hurt several people before she came here. Um, she didn't kill anybody, but she dumped a few people, so she took a little more work to be around. So my staff doesn't go in with her if I'm not here. Uh, she's just a little pushier, a little typical, if you will but she's also my, my smartest. She's my thinker. Uh-huh, I saw that. What's Butch doing? Now, here's a good example. These were somebody's pets. They were getting expensive. They were getting to be a lot for them to handle. Um, they didn't really have to get rid of them, but they called and asked one day if we didn't have a better situation for them. And the only answer I had was, you know, we could put them in with the elephants and if they got along fine, if they didn't, we'd have to turn around and bring them right back. That was, what, 10 years ago? And there are days we come out here and the elephants are resting their trunks on them. Now you're gonna hear a lot of noise probably when the boy comes forward. changes quickly as there is a sudden commotion from the elephants. Big. 
what happened is there was a tractor back there that spooked Butch. He obviously told the girls, and they ran running over there to help him. Huh. You big dork. So you see, in a lot of the larger organizations, accrediting organizations, what we're doing right now shouldn't be happening. But where I come from in the entertainment industry, you're never going to remember knowing elephants from looking at them from a barrier in a zoo like you will today. Um, you got to meet them to know them. And you got to know them to want to help save them. And so, hey, there's humans back here. Charlie has worked with exotics for more than 30 years, and the trust these animals have in him is remarkable. Surely, it must take a special sort of person to be so trusted by a herd of elephants. I do think you have to have the right personality for it. Um, but they're smart, so there is somewhat of a science to it. And if you apply the science, if you learn it and apply it, it works. Uh, we don't do, we don't handle them the way we used to. It's evolved like everything else. Uh, to far a far kind, kinder training now than it used to be, but for the most part, um, yeah, I'd almost say it's somewhat easier than big cats because they're so smart that it removes a lot of the things you have no control of, and uh, you can you can actually apply a little tiny bit of trust. They're like a horse. They're, 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 they're trying, you try to get a horse to step on you or to run you over. I had, to I had a scene once where I had to have a horse charge into me and knock me down. It took us days to find one that would do it. Um, they just instinctually have no interest in hurting you. Um, but on the other hand, they're like children. You have to be their parent before you can be their friend. So you have to find that balance where they respect you enough to know that they have to listen and they have to behave, but there's a reward for it, you know? And they're smart enough to learn real fast it works a lot better that way. Charlie spent years building up his rapport with his elephants, and keeping elephants is a full-time job. In fact, it's a full-time job for several people. Well, here's the problem. We're working with them all day. They're working, their minds are being kept busy. 24-7, we're working with them. And if you don't, they start pushing you around. And then it gets out of hand. Then you lose control, and that's when they become real dangerous. Butch says, I just want to help. Huh. Huh. Big dork. So, again, you can't go to work every day and spend what little time you have left with an elephant. You, you have to be doing it full time. You have to be doing it professionally for a living to keep them manageable. Um, but, on the other hand, do we treat them like pets? We treat everything like pets, but we do it professionally. Spending so much time with his elephants, Charlie is completely at ease with them, but he's always alert to possible dangers. Now, when they all came running, when they all went running that way towards Butch, and Christy was in the middle of it, uh, I won't lie to you. I had a little concern there. That's a lot of elephant and very little Christy. So I headed that way. But once again, we've never had a, a bad day. We've never had an incident. They did just what I thought they were going to do. They ran to Butch because they thought he had a problem. Charlie's closeness to his elephants is as much about enriching their lives as it is about enriching his. The best mental stimulation they have is us. The second best mental stimulation they have is the other animals. And the third is themselves, uh, the, the group. So, but they have a lot of things to do here. In the morning, my elephants deliver breakfast to the bed and breakfast. Um, so they go up and they visit with people. Their breakfast baskets have bags of fruit that they get to share with the elephants. So there's the positive. That's why they walk up there with us and they're happy to do it. In the afternoon, People get to come and help us give them baths. 
and then um, at night they go to bed. They get their treats and they go into their barns and they go to bed. So. This elephant is normally so shy, she'd be standing back over there and I don't even try to make her come visit people. I have no idea what she's doing right now. She's obviously a camera hog. Paula, what's this about? Paula and Christy came together. Both came from circus. Christy back. Christy back. And there were some things we've changed. Like in circuses, they're not allowed to touch things with their tusks. Whereas in our environment, it was okay. So it took a while to teach her that this was okay. We're, uh, we're far more lenient than they needed to be in circus. So, uh, if you will, they get away with a lot more. But we just cut it off at a certain point so that we keep the control and we keep enough respect so it's still a safe activity. There are more than 100 exotic animals at Monterey Zoo, and Charlie claims not to have favorites. Watching him with his elephants, it becomes very obvious that maybe, just maybe, he does. Some, some might say they're the flagship of our zoo. Uh, a lot of elephants, a lot of zoos have elephants. But I, I don't know. I, you know. Everybody finds their magic in a different animal. Some people adore elephants, but some people would get on a plane and travel here for nothing more than those sloths. It's, it's just wherever you find your magic. child, but he's about to do something many adults wouldn't ever consider. He's about to risk his life. Ethan is at his grandfather's rural property where cattle would not be out of place. These are not your average cattle. Ethan's grandfather, Dwayne, raises about 40 Watusi cattle on his Utah ranch. Putting a 10-year-old within reach of an animal of this size and temperament is a risk. But for Dwayne and Ethan, it is a calculated risk. Also known as the cattle of kings, an average Watusi weighs around 1,000 pounds, and their horns are the largest and most dramatic any breed of cattle. That's exactly what makes them one of the most dangerous. Even Dwayne is wary. I can get a little bit closer, but this cow's getting ready to have a calf, and I know her. I get halfway over there, she's gonna chase me out. That cow there will just take her baby and run. This new baby here, her mother would probably let us go up to her, but they are threatening because they're showing you. When they have a baby, you respect that, okay? Uh, you do not play with the babies. We play with one here because we know this cow. I mean, she was bottle raised. These cows here, you know that they're not gonna let you play with their baby. These cattle through the years, because of a lot of times the predators that are in Africa, the hyenas, okay? The mothers have become very, very protective. This little cow behind us, she's showing you she does not want you to play with her baby and so as protective as the mothers are the bulls are really docile they don't care you can take that baby but with the mama you're not going to play with it so why does Dwayne let his grandson climb into a pen with one of these potentially lethal beasts it seems a common theme among owners of dangerous animals familiarity breeds trust this little cow's name is Tina, and she was bottle raised, okay? And that's why she's so gentle. Uh, my grandson, Ethan, here, he raised her on a bottle. This is his cow. And she just uh, had a little baby calf just three days ago. Do you want to catch the calf, Ethan? Now, you can see the little horns are already starting right here. 
you can see some real good growth on them as a year old. They'll be uh, a year old. They should be out, you know, anywhere from uh, eight to 10 inches long and have a base on them probably like that. The breed does well in the Utah climate and it is prized for its good looks, its robust and drought hardy nature, and for those massive horns. Uh, we started raising these in 1982. We've uh, learned a lot about the Watusi. And, uh, you know, actually, uh, uh, a few years ago, we, we sent semen back to South Africa, where these animals originally come from, uh, to get new bloodlines in, into the, a herd over there. We've understood that in Africa, uh, they're after, you know, it, it's a thing of economics. Great big horns, great big long horns is harder for the animal to travel, to feed. And so they're in Africa, they're breeding the horns smaller. Yet in America, because we have an abundance of feed, we want our horns bigger. <laughs> and Dwayne certainly succeeded in breeding cattle with bigger horns. The world's largest, in fact. Dwayne's bull, Woody, earned him a place in the Guinness Book of Records for the largest horn circumference ever recorded. Woody's left horn far outsized its right-hand counterpart, growing to a massive circumference of 40 and a half inches. Although it didn't cause him any pain, it weighed so much that Woody would often rest it on the ground. Dwayne has also managed his herd to maintain the breed's distinctive markings. If you'll notice the markings on this cow, she'll have this, uh, she'll have the straight red over the back and the white down the sides. This guy will hold steel. There are pictures of uh, Watusi cattle on Egyptian walls, they date back 7,000 years, and they have this same design on them. And you won't find any other cattle that's got this design on them unless they've got some Watusi bloodlines in them. In Africa, you'll see a lot of the dark red colors in the tribes. The kings, they, they liked uh, the white Watusi. And a white Watusi is very valuable to them. The herds were seen as a status symbol and played a significant role in tribal life. In Africa, the more Watusis you own, it's kind of a, one of those things, I have more than you, or you know, I have a whole bunch of Watusis, and it's kind of like money in the bank in, in Africa. The size of the horns are intimidating. I think in Africa, if a hyena come up or a lion came to a Watusi cow, you know, they're gonna look at that. They're gonna look at their defense first, you know? And I'm sure, I'm sure depending on what would happen over there, uh, you know, but through the years, the Watusis have developed that real protective instinct to their young. The Watusi's giant horns also help to keep it cool. Hundreds of tiny blood vessels cover the horns close to the surface, allowing heat to escape the body. Uh, where these cows originate from, they take the heat very well. And uh, in the summertime, they'll slick right off, and they've got kind of an oily skin to them, which again, through the years, they've developed uh, kind of a natural pesticide. You can actually rub them and brush them and smell the oil on your hands. They are a hardy cattle. Uh, in the wintertime here, because we have so much cold, we make sure that they have all the feed they want to eat and we provide shelter for them. They don't have a lot of hair on their ears and they don't have a lot of a long hair like a, a normal cattle would. But you put fat on them, put some meat on them, and they do better. The majority of incidents involving cattle occur on ranches and other sites where people are working with livestock. Hundreds of people are injured and 22 killed each year in the U.S. alone. Knowing the risks of accidents and that the cows can be easily provoked, Dwayne is always mindful of the danger. 
there is an element of danger. It's the same as any other animal. You take a, a beef cow, they're gonna protect their baby, okay? Some of them are not gonna be as aggressive as others, okay? The same as a dog that just had brand new puppies. Some of them are gonna let you play with them puppies and some of them are not. Again, maybe the breed of a puppy or the breed of a different cattle is gonna determine how protective they're gonna be with their babies. The Watusis, normally you gotta remember that they're protective. You know, you notice how long the horns are and how big they are, and yet you'll, you'll notice these cows don't use them as like a spear. I've seen so many little tiny sharp horns do so much damage to people and yet these bigger horns like this, they'll actually, when they want another cow out of the road or if they want you out of the road, they'll swing it and use it more like a bat. While Ethan has never been hurt by his cows, Dwayne himself has learned some important lessons the hard way. I had my uh, knee replaced and I got too close to a brand new baby and the mother beat me to the fence <laughs> and she hit me and all she did was just, she just hit me and turned around and went back to her baby and that you know that that's when I learned I can't I can't move that fast stay away <laughs> like any large creature no matter how familiar you are with the animal its unpredictability is an ever-present danger the thing you always want to remember is know your animals they're having babies and they're protective. We have a couple of new babies over here. The one, the mother took it and left. The other one is a new mother and she's kind of, she doesn't really mind if you're, you're around her baby, but you, again, you have to know the animals. It's obvious Dwayne takes great pride in his unusual herd and he treats his Watusi with just the amount of respect horns like theirs deserve. One thing to remember, if I run, you run. Yes. <laughs> Please run slower than I do. <laughs> it may come as a surprise to some that the hills on the edge of the Cleveland National Forest, just outside of Alpine, California, are home to lions, tigers, and bears. Bobby Brink is the founder of Lions, Tigers, and Bears, a no-kill, no-breed, no-sell exotic animal sanctuary. The white tiger cub is one of their recent rescues. Well, I thought I was going to be in the hospitality business. I, that's what I went to school for. It's funny, God sends you a different direction when you think you know what you're doing. Bobby began working with exotic animals in 1992 when she took a job with a breeder and exhibitor. She quickly realized that it was not the dream job she had expected. I met a guy with bears, and he taught me how to take care of bears. And then he would disappear all the time. And if I wouldn't go feed the bears, they wouldn't have food or water. And he'd be gone like weeks at a time. So I followed him one day. I followed him up from South Texas to the Texas-Arkansas border. And what he was doing is he would set up a ring and they were wrestling bears, so you could pay $1,000 for the man to wrestle the bears, and then all the other men would bet who was gonna win, I guess who was gonna win, the bear or the man. And then I just, you know, started seeing more and more and more. Because it's just amazing some, some of the places we go and, and the way people treat animals, and you know, they'll have no fur from urine, and they're laying in their own urine, and they're drinking their own urine, and they don't see anything wrong. Like, they don't see that they're doing anything wrong. That amazes me. Lions, Tigers, and Bears was founded in 2002 when Bobby rescued two endangered Bengal tigers. Only Bobby's direct intervention and negotiation with the owner saved them. They were backyard pets. They were housed in a six by 12. Uh, no shade, no shelter. You and I couldn't live like that for five or six years. And the guy was threatening to shoot the animals if 
the fish and U.S. Fish and Wildlife didn't leave him alone because he considered them his property. But they worked it out, and he decided that we could take the tigers. And U.S. Fish and Wildlife gave us 30 days, and that's when we built that first small enclosure. You know, because we only had 30 days to get the permits, cross the state lines, build something to house the tigers, and get them and get them here. And that that was the start. We like to say here they go from rags to riches because the animals we take here are usually the, the ones that nobody else will take. There's no place for them to go because we work all over the country with the first responders. I've probably moved 400 animals, all lions, tigers, bears, cougars in, in the last five years to different sanctuaries across the country. So we work with a lot of sanctuaries, work with a lot of first responders, a lot of state authorities, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Game. Oh, even private owners, you know, and we don't judge. If you have got an animal and you're in over your head and you know, you're ready to find that animal home and you know, 90% of the time, that's what we see happens with private ownership. Seeing tigers for sale in a Walmart parking lot and at cattle auctions and seeing big cat cubs used for photo opportunities, Bobby knew she was on the right path. You know, I went to one place on the East Coast, me and my, my friend, and the one photo facility had 22 cubs. So you know they, they can only use them till they're, they're so big and then they've got to replace those cubs with more, more cubs. So where do all the, all the babies go? I believe some of them go to canned hunts, which is, you know, small area for people to shoot for a trophy, or they go as backyard pets, they're disposed of. Some of them are probably just killed and buried. There's no federal tracking of these animals. The lucky ones get to come to a legitimate sanctuary where they're not going to be bred and at least get their dignity back and, and live out their life. The majority of animals Bobby now takes care of have been rescued from private owners and even from other sanctuaries. An appointment with the vet is one of their first experiences at their new home. Most of the animals that we go in and get, they've never had any medical care, never, no dental. Like the, the two leopards we have right now in the quarantine, we've spent six months of medical, you know, and then the female couldn't put any weight on her front feet because she had been declawed all the way around to, so they could use her for the photo ops. And so she was literally trying to walk on her back feet. So when we went in to do the surgery on her feet, we ended up finding a, you know, a lump on her, on her abdomen and it ended up being a mass on her uterus. And so, you know, it just seems like one thing after another medically for her. And we're still trying to get her up here with the other cats since she's been here a year. And that looks like it's cleared up. So that's usually the best sign. The white tiger cub also had severe health problems when first rescued. And after weeks in quarantine, her final vet check before going to a new enclosure is a great game. Now that she's, her lesions are growing, or coming back, we can do another fungal culture with the, that little DTM stuff. Have you seen it? It's like special lockers. Bobby's 93-acre sanctuary is now home to a variety of rescued animals, and for many of them, the sanctuary was the first time they'd ever seen the sky or felt sunshine. This is the first time the white tiger cub has ever been on grass. But rescuing exotic animals is dangerous work. Honestly, I think the first few weeks when I worked around these animals, I didn't think they were as dangerous as they are. I think the fear comes in after you experience, you know, a few things. And I think for myself, the danger is when we go into dangerous places and get animals out. Because a lot of times the cages are so dangerous, we can't dart because if they jump, they'll go through go through the cage. Or people have them housed in their dining room or their garage or their basement. They never really think about getting the animal out. Like there's no way to get a transfer cage down the basement stairs or in their little gates. Our cages don't fit through. You know, those are the more dangerous circumstances for my staff. Rather than send her staff into dangerous situations, Bobby often puts herself in the line of fire. And when I first started working with the animals, I worked free contact inside the cage. I've just chose not to get anybody hurt. 
and a lot of times when you're rescuing animals we don't even know you know these animals past how they were raised it's just better safe than sorry because the way we've set up everything here is pretty safe. They work in twos. Uh, they'll shift the animal, which means they'll put it in an empty cage. And then the second person goes back and checks all the locks, checks that it's empty, and then they'll go in and clean. And then the same thing, when they go to put them back in the cage, they'll check the locks and then put it back. And then the second person will go back and check the lock. But that doesn't mean that human error can't happen because if something happens, it would be human error. Somebody will make a mistake. That's why your buddy's so important because that person has to have your back. <laughs> These animals could kill you in a second. <laughs> in a second. For Bobby, the benefits far outweigh the risk. Sometimes an animal's rehabilitation requires a lot of patience. You know, like we had one bear we brought from Ohio, and he was fine as long as you kept him locked up. Like when we brought him in the trailer, we all the way across the country, we'd open the door and feed him, and he was fine, clean him out, and no problems. And then we brought him here, we always put animal in the quarantine and do all their medical, he was fine. But when we put him out in the habitat and opened the door to let him out, he was scared to death. And he'd just run back and forth and pace. So, we would just open the door for 15 minutes and the next day for an hour and then, you know, a couple weeks later for half a day and until the door was just left open. And then finally he would touch the dirt because he'd never touched dirt before. And then finally he would go out in and out, you know, make sure his little safety place was still there. Now he uses the whole habitat. Bobby's priority is always the welfare of the animal. But how is her sanctuary any different to a zoo? I think one of the biggest questions we get here is why don't you give the animals to the zoo? And I think we do something totally different than a zoo or two totally different organizations, but a lot of people don't realize these animals originated as surplus animals from the zoos, from the breeding programs, and that's how they got out into the private sector. Bobby has strong views on the breeding and keeping of captive animals, views that have been established through many years of experience and firsthand knowledge. There's approximately 220 AZA zoos in our country, and that's who holds the SSP plan, the Species Survival Plan, in our country. So supposedly this is the legitimate breeding that's going on in our country. You know, that's 220 zoos breeding. It's a lot. And you know, these are not animals that can go back in the wild. So there's really not much conservation value. The breeding is for the animals to stay in captivity. You can't put a lion or a tiger or a bear back out. They're going to walk right up to you for food. And I don't think a lot of people realize that these animals are not being put back out in the wild. There is no proven plan to put them back that, that's working. And a lot of them, they don't know how to be a tiger. I've brought bears in here that are scared to death of space. You know, it took us six months to get the white tiger to walk out in the open space because she had never been out of a 10 by 10 and she was used for nothing other than breeding. So when she came here and there's the green grass and the pool, and the, she was afraid of the waterfall. So it just, a lot of TLC, a lot of time. And you know, now she'll use the, the whole habitat, but it took a long time. You know, one of the most important things we can give our animals is dirt. You know, it's like the difference of standing on a tile floor all day versus standing on carpet all day. There's a huge difference, and it makes a huge difference in arthritis and, and how their joints feel, and especially when it's cold. Seeing distressed and mistreated animals takes an emotional toll, and Bobby also struggles with the idea that even the sanctuary she offers isn't ideal. It's just a glamorized prison. That's what it is. You and I wouldn't want to live in there. I mean, it's beautiful, but you wouldn't want to stay in there for life. You know, when I first started working around the animals, I really didn't see anything wrong with the way they were housed and, you know, people having them as pets. And I think it just grows on you. Like myself, I've been, you know, working around these animals almost every single day since 1990. And it's really obvious they don't belong in a cage. So part of Bobby's goal is to ensure that the animals live as closely as possible to how they would in the wild. They don't make good pets. It's, I think it's selfish, you know, and that's one thing that I've questioned myself about, you know, am I being selfish by, 
you know, wanting to have the animals and I had to like get in check and make sure that there's a reason for every animal to be here. You know, just like the little bobcat that we took in Diego. If he could have went back out in the wild, that would have been the best thing for him. But unfortunately, he can't go back out in the wild, so he needs a place to, to live out his life. Rescued grizzly bear Albert suffered from malnutrition that caused permanent neurological problems. And not all of the rescues turn out well. They've destroyed part of his life. You know, the MRI shows he has no pain, but he still has to really think and rock back and forth to get up. And then he has to really think, you know, his brain has to think where he's putting his, his paws to, to walk. I've, of all the animals I have moved, I had to euthanize one lion. And it, that was very heartbreaking because it was just a big, beautiful lion. And he was literally dragging his back legs, you know, to the, to the point where he was open wounds, you know, from drag. He could not move his back legs at all. That, that was hard. And it was really hard because he was in with two females. So not only did we have to euthanize him, but then we had to move the females out of their home. That was hard. Bobby will continue to provide safe and enriching environments for abused and neglected animals already in captivity, leaving future generations to continue to ponder the question of finding a better solution. I always tell my students and my interns, they're the ones, the younger generation, they're gonna make the decision. Do we work on saving the wild tigers in the wild? Because we only have about 3,000 tigers left in the wild. And it would be really nice to keep the ones that we have in the wild protected. Or do we continue to breed these animals for nothing more than to live in a cage? It will go to that generation. And again, they'll, they'll make that decision. But these animals, they live 20 years. So, you know, I figure I can do this a good 20, 30 more years. And, you know, hopefully there'll be some more laws in place to protect the animals and there won't be as many animals in need of sanctuary. I mean, that would be ideal.